What if I told you that a simple mistake, something that happens every day, could ignite a disaster so massive that it would become the most expensive industrial accident in history? On March 23, 2005, in Texas City, a refinery turned into a war zone in just seconds. 15 lives were lost instantly, and 180 people were injured, leaving the world shocked by a tragedy that should never have happened. But how did a routine operation go so terribly wrong? What events led to an explosion that shook the entire industry? Join us as we uncover the truth behind the Texas City refinery explosion. Before we dive into the background of this disaster, I invite you to subscribe this channel and hit the notification bell for more documentaries like this. The Texas City Refinery was established in 1933 by Pan American Refining Corporation. In 1954, Pan American joined with Standard Oil of Indiana to create Amoco. BP took over the refinery in 1999 after merging with Amoco. By January 2005, the refinery had become the second largest in Texas and the fourth largest in the United States, with a capacity of 475,000 barrels per day. At the time of the accident, it was one of three refineries in Texas City, along with Marathon Petroleum and Valero Energy. Since 1974, there had been 23 deaths in 20 different accidents at the Texas City refinery, including three deaths in 2004, just a year before the explosion. Many of these accidents were caused by fires or explosions following leaks of process fluids. One of the most serious incidents happened in July 1979 when a pipe failure led to a large release of hydrocarbons. The resulting explosion caused significant damage, breaking windows up to 1.5 miles away and causing $24 million in property loss, about $101 million in 2024. The refinery had suffered from poor maintenance for years. Starting in the early 1990s, budget cuts by Amoco and later BP greatly reduced spending on maintenance and safety. In 2002, BP hired a consulting firm, A.T. Kearney, to investigate why the refinery's performance was declining. The report found that budget cuts were causing worsening conditions at the plant. A 2003 internal audit revealed a culture of blame and poor asset management, with management not addressing safety concerns properly. Another audit in 2004 found problems in all areas of process safety management. In January 2005, a consulting firm called Telos found many safety hazards at the refinery, including broken alarms, thinning pipes, and falling debris. The isomerization plant, ISOM, at the refinery was designed to convert low-octane hydrocarbons into higher-octane ones, which could be blended into unleaded gasoline. This process involved converting straight-chain hydrocarbons like N-pentane and N-hexane into branched ones like isopentane and isohexane. The plant included a desulfurization system, an isomerization reactor, a vapor recovery unit, and a raffinate splitter. On February 21, 2005, BP began remedial work on the raffinate splitter. At the same time, two turnaround activities at other units, the ultracracker and aromatics recovery units, were also undergoing maintenance. During these activities, BP often set up portable buildings and trailers as temporary offices near the work areas. On March 23rd, the startup process began with the night shift lead operator filling the splitter tower. Normally, a pre-startup safety review, PSSR, should be done to prevent unexpected issues, but BP did not follow this procedure. The level transmitter was supposed to measure the raffinate level in the tower, and a high-level alarm went off at 3.09 a.m. when the level reached 7.6 feet. However, during startups, it was common practice to ignore this alarm and continue filling the tower to 99% capacity to avoid damaging the furnace. What the operators didn't realize was that the level transmitter was not properly calibrated, so its readings were not accurate. An independent alarm should have gone off at 7.9 feet but failed to trigger. At 5 a.m., the night shift lead operator briefed the central control room and left early. 
The day shift operator arrived at 6 a.m., starting his 30th consecutive 12-hour shift. By that time, the level was already at 13 feet, but the operator believed it was still below 9 feet. At 7.15 a.m., over an hour late for his shift, one of the day shift supervisors arrived at the central control room. During the morning meeting, it was mentioned that the heavy raffinate storage tanks were nearly full, and another supervisor was told to stop the startup process. However, this message didn't get passed on, so the startup continued just before 9.30 a.m. under the first supervisor's orders. The level control valve for the splitter tower, which should have been automatically regulated, was set to manual mode and accidentally closed off due to a faulty flow transmitter. This error, along with other malfunctioning instruments, allowed the liquid level in the tower to rise without anyone noticing, leaving the operators unaware of the growing danger. Just before 10 a.m., the circulation process restarted, adding more raffinate to the already overfilled tower. Since the control valve was shut, no heavy raffinate could be transferred to the storage tank, causing the tower to fill up even more. The defective level transmitter kept showing a false reading, and a visual check wasn't possible because the sight glass was cloudy. At 9.55 a.m., two burners in the furnace were turned on to preheat the raffinate going into the tower and to heat the raffinate at the bottom. Two more burners were lit at 11.16 a.m. The procedure required a gradual temperature increase, but instead of the recommended 10 degrees Celsius per hour, the temperature rose by 23 degrees Celsius per hour, reaching 153 degrees Celsius. The faulty level transmitter kept showing a safe level in the tower, but the level control valve was still closed, stopping heavy raffinate from flowing to the storage tank. Instead of being at the indicated 8.65 feet, the liquid had actually reached 67 feet by midday, and with the increasing heat, it rose to 98 feet. As the liquid level climbed, pressure began to build up in the system due to the compressed hydrocarbon vapors and nitrogen trapped in the tower. The operations crew thought the pressure increase was caused by overheating, a common issue during startup, and tried to release the pressure. By 12.42 p.m., the furnaces were turned down and the level control valve was finally opened, allowing heavy raffinate to drain from the splitter tower. The gas to the furnace was shut off, but raffinate continued to flow into the tower. The operators relied on the level transmitter, which showed the level dropping to 78%, 7.9 feet. But in reality, the fluid had risen to 158 feet in the 170-foot tall tower. When the heavy raffinate flow was opened, it caused the temperature inside the splitter to spike, leading to rapid vaporization. This pressure buildup pushed a large amount of liquid into the overhead line. At 1.13 p.m., the pressure reached over 42 psi, causing the relief valves to open. In just six minutes, more than 51,900 gallons of hot raffinate were released into the collection system before the valves closed. The hot raffinate flowed into the blowdown drum and stack, quickly filling it up. As the stack overflowed, a 20-foot geyser of hot raffinate shot into the air, raining down and pooling around the unit. A radio call warned the control room that hot hydrocarbons were spilling from the stack, but the plant evacuation alarm was not sounded, leaving people nearby unaware of the danger before the ignition occurred. A diesel pickup truck was parked about 25 feet from the blowdown stack, with its engine left running. As the vapor cloud spread, hydrocarbon fumes were drawn into the truck's air intake, causing the engine to, to race uncontrollably. Workers nearby tried to shut off the engine but couldn't, and as the cloud grew larger, they were forced to retreat. The vapor cloud continued to spread across the ISOM plant and into the trailer area, but no emergency alarm was triggered. Around 1.20 p.m., the cloud ignited, likely due to a backfire from the overheating truck engine, as witnessed by those nearby. The dense equipment and piping in the area accelerated the spread of the flames, triggering a massive vapor cloud explosion that could be heard miles away. The blast wave hit a cluster of contractor trailers just 121 feet from the blowdown stack, completely destroying them. Debris flew everywhere, killing 15 people instantly and injuring 180 others. Some trailers were damaged as far as 600 feet away, and over 40 trailers were affected. Most of the victims were contractors. 
The explosion also caused structural damage to 50 storage tanks, with one releasing over 2,750 pounds of benzene. The fire that followed burned through an estimated 200,000 square feet of the refinery, causing millions of dollars in damage. The blast was so powerful that it blew out windows up to three quarters of a mile away. The site's emergency response team quickly launched a search and rescue operation. An order was issued for 43,000 people to shelter in place. The feed to the raffinate splitter wasn't shut down immediately, but it stopped at 2.45 p.m. when the power went out. Around 150 to 200 firefighters worked for two hours to bring the fires under control. Ambulances and life flight were stood down by 4.44 p.m., and the final body was discovered under debris around 11 p.m. After the explosion, BP's in-house experts, along with various authorities and committees, launched investigations into the technical, organizational, and safety culture aspects of the disaster. BP conducted several internal investigations, including the Mogford investigation, which focused on the accident's root causes, and the Bonzi and Stanley investigations, which looked at procedural and cultural factors, as well as managerial accountability. Additionally, an independent panel, led by James Baker and recommended by the U.S. Chemical Safety Board, CSB, was commissioned by BP to examine management and safety culture issues. The CSB also conducted its own extensive investigation, focusing on technical and procedural aspects. A team of experts, led by John Mogford, BP's Senior Vice President for Safety and Operations, investigated the technical aspects of the explosion and recommended corrective actions. They released an interim report on May 12, 2005. The report also highlighted five underlying cultural issues, a resistant work environment with low motivation, trust, and unclear management expectations. Process safety not being prioritized by management. Organizational complexity with unclear responsibilities and poor communication. A tendency to accept high levels of risk due to poor hazard awareness. Failure to recognize early warning signs of plant and procedure deterioration. Given the scale of the disaster, the Chemical Safety Board, CSB, investigated the safety management at the Texas City Refinery, BP Group's role, and OSHA's effectiveness as a regulatory body. The CSB team arrived on site 48 hours after the accident, with 13 investigators remaining there for three months. The investigation had a budget of $2.5 million, during which the CSB reviewed over 30,000 documents interviewed 370 witnesses, and conducted computer modeling and testing. The results were published on March 20, 2007, in a 341-page report, the most extensive investigation ever conducted by the nine-year-old agency. One of the key findings of the Chemical Safety Board, CSB, was that the blowdown system at the ISOM unit was outdated and dangerously inadequate. It was located in the middle of the plant, where it could release heavy vapors into areas where people worked. The CSB found that BP ignored multiple warnings and safety recommendations about this system before the explosion. Several critical safety items were not working, which contributed to the disaster. None of the four level readings and alarms on the splitter tower were operational. This included the process control level transmitter, two independent high- and low-level switches, though the low-level switch wasn't involved in the accident, the level sight glass at the bottom of the tower, and the flow transmitter for heavy raffinate. The Chemical Safety Board, CSB, found that organizational and safety failures at all levels of BP contributed to the refinery explosion. BP had made significant cuts to safety budgets and spending even though much of the refinery's infrastructure and equipment were in poor condition. The company also reduced training and staffing levels. The explosion caused $200 million in property damage, which would be $312 million in 2024. Several refinery units were shut down, and the entire refinery was closed in preparation for Hurricane Rita later in 2005. BP then focused on repairing the damage from both the explosion and the hurricane with the process units restarting in March 2006. 
The total cost of repairs and lost production exceeded $1 billion. BP pled guilty to federal environmental crimes and paid $50 million in fines. The company also paid around $2.1 billion in civil settlements, $84.6 million in fines to OSHA, $27 million to the EPA, and $50 million to the state of Texas for environmental violations. This disaster remains the world's costliest refinery accident. As we've seen, the Texas City refinery explosion was a tragic event that revealed serious problems in safety management and corporate priorities. But it also makes us ask important questions. How can we make sure that safety always comes first, before profit? What lessons should industries learn to prevent future disasters like this? We'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think could have been done differently? Share your opinions in the comments below, and let's discuss how we can all work towards a safer future.